Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for uh, coming. I know it's the end of the show. Everybody is uh, on their way back home. So uh, thank you for the time. Um, so my name is Shaul. Uh, I'm the co-founder of uh, RealView Imaging. And RealView Imaging is all about digital holograms. So we've been uh, working on digital holograms for the past almost decade. And when I say holograms, it's real holograms, meaning interference-based holograms. Uh, so we interfere light in free space. So before real view imaging, I've been working on uh, augmented reality. Uh, this is one of the projects I've been working in uh, for also almost a decade in the field of uh, helmet-mounted displays for aviation and a company named Elbit Systems in Israel. So they actually have augmented reality systems uh, flying around in the most advanced combat uh, aircrafts, uh, usually with the good guys. A little bit about uh, real view imaging. So the company was uh, established in 2008. We're in Israel, which is a short flight from here, about 15 hours flight from here. Um, and we are doing the, currently the most advanced system uh, volumetric holographic augmented reality. So it's a system level full solution. It's not only software or hardware or optics or electro optics is everything. Uh, we got an award lately from Frost and Sullivan for our digital light shaping technology. Uh, we are proven in medical, and I will show you some medical uh, real holograms that we've been working on uh, in many years now. Um, and it is a fully working technology, and our first commercial product uh, will be launched this year. I think it's going to be the first ever uh, volume real-time holograms. So it's a kind of uh, almost uh, statement here. But it's not a launch yet. So what is it that we are doing? We are working on uh, two main configurations. Both of them are on the same technology that we call digital light shaping. On the left side, you can see uh, our holoscope eye system. The holoscope eye system is aimed for interventional cardiology, and later on is going to go to interventional oncology. So it is real-time holograms for the physician during the catheterization process. Uh, it is very challenging uh, for us. It was. And still is very challenging for us to build such a system because, because of regulation and sterility, um, a headset cannot go into an uh, interventional suite or operating room. So we had to build a system that, in a way, it's a part of the room, but uh, every user can use it. Uh, so we had to build a system that the envelope of performance is huge. Any, anyone in this crowd can come to the system and see the hologram. Of course, each of us is very different, uh, so the system is uh, quite advanced. And on the right side, you can see uh, our headset configuration that we are uh, currently working on and developing, uh, which is based on the same technology. For us, it's uh, substantially, uh, I would say, uh, easier because the system is on the head, is moving with the head, the optics are closer to the eye, there is only one user, uh, so it makes things easier. From other hands, it makes more challenges because it has to look good or better. It has to be fashionable, etc. So I hope you like this. A little bit about uh, holography. Why is it important? So if we want to understand holography, we have to go back to how we see things with our eyes. So I think Apple defined a, a beautiful uh, term. They call it retina display. Probably everybody here understands what is retina display. It is a display that the resolution is better than what your eye can see. And then if, if you have this kind of a display, you will not see any pixelation. So first of all, I, I totally agree with that. But probably everybody here knows that we also can see deep. Our focus can be changed. So what about depth resolution? Uh, and, and probably you saw uh, at the show, at the expo here, you saw uh, many beautiful technologies. But then, is, everybody, is anybody uh, paying attention to this very basic uh, um, parameter? So if we are looking on our optical system of the eye, so you can, you, you can find it easily in the literature, that uh, we have a 0 0.15 to 0 0.2 dioptria in our eye. So if 
And this is the, the way that we can discriminate different depth planes. And if you are doing the inverse of it, so you can easily define what are the number of focal planes that are required to have a retina depth resolution. Just like retina resolution for X and Y, or for angular resolution, there is also retina display for the depth. And if you would like to create uh, a system that is better than your eye vision, so you have to create this number of focal planes at the same time. By the way, our eye constantly is, um, is moving forward and backward. The focus is moving constantly backward and forward. This is why it is so easy for us to change focus. If you recall, when you're driving, you can see to infinity and then take your eyes to the radio or to the touch screen, and immediately you're in focus. This is because the eye constantly is, uh, is, track, is searching the depth uh, all the time and, and looking for the correct depth of uh, what you are actually looking at. So if we are doing some kind of a comparison between the different um, technologies that are out there, so for example, 3D cinema or any stereoscopic HMD, Usually the image is focused, uh, it could be two meters or eight feet or infinity, but it's quite far away. And if you're trying to look on something that is far away, like uh, a car from two or four meters or anything else, so it's, it's very easy and very comfortable to do it with any of the technologies. What you see here on, on the upper right, in the, on the upper right is the, uh, or actually the upper deck here is a uh, stereoscopic solution. Then the second one could be uh, multi-display or light field display. So it has more than uh, one focal plane, for example, three focal planes. And on the bottom you can see computer generated holography. That for the hologram you can create as many depth as, as you like. Uh, it's only a matter of computation, of course. And at some point, of course, you cannot uh, exceed uh, the information. But, um, of course, you can create many depth planes at the same time. Now, if you're trying to look on something very, very close to you, for example, Hendridge, and, of course, I think many of the AR applications are talking about interacting with data within your Hendridge. This is very, very basic for every human being. So if you're trying to focus on something very close to you, let's say 400 or 500 millimeters from your eyes, so, of course, if you are trying to use stereoscopic solution, image will be blurred. Uh, if you're trying to use um, uh, light field, for example, that has three focal planes, so when you are on the specific focal plane, it will be uh, okay. But if you are going slightly away of it, it's going to be blurred again. And I would like to emphasize here that if you are looking on the difference of the dioptria of the eye, between infinity and, say, three meters. So and you see that, for example, one focal plane or two focal planes can uh, give a very good solution for that. As soon as you come very close, and you can even test it right now, if you come really close and try now to see uh, from, let's say, 250 millimeters or 25 centimeters from your eye, so the same Verges accommodation conflict that you have from infinity to three meters, you have the same Verges accommodation conflict for something that is now only uh, 250 millimeters from you and has a mismatch of one, only one centimeter. The sensation, the problematism of the Verges accommodation conflict will be the same. And what we can see with computer-generated holography is that actually you can create as many focal planes as you like or as needed. You don't want to make any, any more than required. You want to have a depth retina display. And then you can see the image just like any other optical, uh, any other uh, object. So it's optical reality. For example, if you take um, uh, some kind of a, of a current solution, no matter what solution, and you put, instead of your eye, you put a camera inside. And now the camera, and now you focus the camera. So the camera will be focused to, let's say, I don't know, three meters. And now you try, and now you move the image. You move it back and forth and back and forth. The camera will stay on three meters. Nothing will be changed there because the focus remains constant. 
If you're going to, for example, a holographic uh, display, and it has multiple focal planes, and not only one or two, so then if you change the focus, or if you move the image, so of course the focus will be changed, just like any other object in our life. We call it optical reality. The thing becomes much more complicated for our comprehension, and it booms the problem when you try to touch the image. Because our, uh, our body feels exactly where the location of your hand, uh, and then when you look on your finger and on the image, you are expecting to see the image exactly in the right location. And we are extremely sensitive to this sensation. If you're trying to look on the applications that, uh, that augmented reality can go to, so in general, this is very, very general, of course. So there are uh, consumer applications and professional applications. By the way, we are extremely focused on uh, professional applications. So you can see that for sports and fitness, uh, even one AR, or not even, one, uh, one, uh, one uh, I AR is sufficient Usually the focus is to infinity. When you're driving the car, you look to infinity. Uh, of course, three meters and on, or two meters and on is like infinity. Uh, and when you're driving your bicycle, or when you're running, or even in a warehouse, when you're looking on, on something that is far away from you, so infinity is very good. If you're trying to look on the right side for uh, very complicated things that you would like to do for a long period of time, so your... Uh, your brain accumulates this uh, virgin's accommodation mismatch. And, and definitely for people that are working for many hours with, with the 3D information in front of them, so we feel that uh, there is a lot of advantage, advantage working with a holographic solution. So probably some of you uh, know uh, Professor Dennis Gabor. Professor Dennis Gabor is the inventor of holography, got a Nobel Prize for that. And, of course, uh, in real view, we like him very much. Uh, we have a picture of him in the company because he, we owe him a lot. But probably all the holograms that you, you saw, um, or at least 99.99% .99 were static holograms. They are static and usually monochromatic. And it, this is exciting when you see it. It's beautiful. Uh, of course, this is just a picture of a hologram, but when you see a hologram, you can literally touch every part of it, very easily focus your hand on the specific area that you are trying to touch. And the big question is, if it's out there for so many years, why can't we see it in our uh, living room today? And the reason is that there are uh, huge challenges. This is why it took us almost a decade uh, to get to a system that we can commercialize this year. I would go quite quickly on holography, uh, on the basic principles of holography. So in holography, if you have a three-dimensional object, like this one, and you put a film, like we used to have in the cameras, but more sensitive, and then you light it with coherent light, and you take a reference beam, which is the same light, and hit the film, and in parallel, the light hits the object, and some of it is diffused and goes to the film as well. Then you take this little film and develop it. Many times it, you have to do it one or two or three or five times before it goes nicely. But then the beautiful thing about holography is that just like the light and the object created the interference pattern on the film, then the light and the interference pattern are reconstructing the virtual image and they uh, reconstruct it. If you have a perfect hologram, there will be no difference between the hologram and the actual uh, object in real life. The problem here, of course, is that you have to have a very complicated setup in a laboratory. You have to have it extremely stable because even the little movements of the building can change the hologram. And then you have, if you succeed in that, you have only one hologram, and, and this is something that today, in today's life, when you want everything to be real time in front of you, uh, as you see it, as you interact with it, so it's only good for museums and, uh, uh, and maybe on your uh, living room wall. 
So how can we do it in real time? We can introduce, instead of a film, we can put a spatial light modulator. And a spatial light modulator can be, for us, just like a digital film. Just to, to give you a better uh, feeling on how can information be created in free space, because holography is like registering a volume in free space, or like printing something in free space with light in 60 hertz, like rap rapid prototype in 60 hertz. So how can we do that? So imagine that there is some magical box that we call it digital light shaping. Of course, it's not magical, it's pure physics. And then if you create a planar wave of light, our digital light shaping uh, technology can shape it into a sphere. Then the sphere is going and converging to a point. And from that moment on, it goes to your eye. And for you, it's just like any other object in reality. Of course, if you would like to uh, have it designed within an augmented reality solution, so the realization can be different. For example, you can see it here. Using a, it is very basic, of course, to show the idea that you can project the interference pattern directly to your eye. And then when you look through the beam splitter, you see the reality in front of you, and you can see the hologram at the same time. They are both registered, spatially registered, correctly. So unfortunately, we could not bring the prototype here. So what we did, uh, we took a camera and put it instead of your eye in our system. And what I will show you right now are some holograms that we're taking uh, using this camera. Uh, this, you will not see any elephants here. So this is all real things pictured with a real camera in a real scene. This is a dragon from a game. You can see very easily that this dragon is located in space just where my hand is. This, is a, this dragon has many focal planes. We also track the hand in real time and then you can move the image. So we kind of glue the image to your hand. Try to look on this bird that we created. So the bird is in my hand now. Now it is flying away and the focus is going after it. So my hand is now out of focus. Now the bird is in focus with the tree. We didn't change anything in the optical path. This is only by fringe pattern update. And here you can see some of the applications that we are now focusing on. This is a, a valve on a stand before implantation. This is a many tens of thousands of dollar reimbursement procedure. And we are focusing today on this kind of procedure. So again, when you look on uh, holography and what are the challenges with holography and, and, questioning, and questioning what, how come we don't have any real volumetric holograms around us. So the major issues are the issues that are listed here. The image quality usually is very low, very speckly, very noisy, the resolution low. Usually the optical power is, uh, of the spatial light modulator or the size of the pixel pitch is, is very small, so it results with a very small hologram or a, a very small field of view, usually both. So you can see it from, with one eye um, from an extremely small uh, field of view. Then if you would like to realize real-time holography, usually you need a NASA computer, so only NASA has a NASA computer. And, and then um, when, you, when you go into the very details of digital holograms, so there are questions on, let's say if I, if I can create holograms uh, in 2D, and then I am trying to superimpose in some way. So usually there are some uh, challenges and problems. Um, they are interfere one with, uh, with another, and they uh, uh, are limited to a specific area. And these are things that we had to overcome. And the optical design is not very straightforward. And then after you have everything ready, then, when you have the hologram in front of you, okay, I have a hologram, so what do I do right now? So, when you try to touch the image, it's very convenient, but now you want the image to, to move. You want to, to be able to cut it, to mark inside, to crop, to do many, many other things. So, 
I think we are very fortunate in, in RealView that we, we had the opportunity to light this and reconstruct this hologram in free space to start working on this long ago. So we have a lot of experience on how to interact with hologram. We call it HHI, Holographic Human Interface. So we talked about uh, how the hologram is being created. Uh, and I would like to show you a very top level on, on how we are doing that in real view imaging. So if you look on this, and uh, of course, if we know this object geometry, let's say I, I get it from a game or CAD application or ultra, 3D ultrasound or 3D CT, and then I know what is the light that I'm using, for example, let's say 600 nanometers, and I know what is the distance between them, and I know exactly where the user eye is located, so I can numerically compute what is the propagation of light, how it will hit this object, and then how it will be diffused to, the to this film, and in parallel, what would be the interference pattern that would have been created if we do it in a laboratory, and then I can do it uh, using a computer with our algorithms. So for example, if you take a voxel, of course there is hardware that receives the information, and then you parse the information, and then you put it into the uh, CGH, the Computer Generated Holography uh, process. So for example, if you take a very, very simplified image, like a voxel, which is a point in space, you can, of course, uh, define it as a vector, X, Y, Z, maybe color, transparency, uh, some other metadata, and then you put it inside the computer-generated holography. When it's in the computer-generated holography, you take into consideration shelling and lighting and colors and interface and many other things, and then you compute the interference pattern. What would have been the interference pattern given we have done this laboratory experiment using this point in space? So when you look on one point, it looks uh, almost logical. But when you're taking, for example, a mitral valve, this is a mitral valve. Each of you has one. I also have one. So this mitral valve is a cloud of voxels that we receive in real time from, for example, 3D ultrasound. So we have to now receive the information, parse the information. So this is a lot of material, a lot of data in the same time. And then the same computer-generated holography calculation is being implemented, and then we receive this interference pattern. So this interference pattern, now you see that for a complicated image, it doesn't make any sense, of course, unless you have coherent light from your eyes. And, of course, we now take this interference pattern, and then we drive it to our uh, electro-optical system. This would be the next phase. And from the optical system, we have to light it with the relevant coherent light for this specific uh, interference pattern. And then, in the speed of light, the image is being created in front of the user, occupying a volume. So as I mentioned, we have two configurations. Uh, both of them are, are based on the very same technology. And few words about the, the application. So given you have this capability, uh, and you, now we want to try to understand what can be done with that. So as I mentioned already, uh, our company is extremely focused on professional applications um, because we believe that there is the greatest need there uh, for people that are working with 3D uh, for the entire day. It's very important for them not to get a headache and being able to really do very accurate things. So in medical imaging, for example, there is an abundance of 3D information all the way from obstetrics, uh, through CT, through real-time ultrasound, through pseudo-real-time electrophysiology. And all this beautiful information today is being captured uh, 3D, but then it's being displayed 2D. So what we're doing, we have developed uh, one of our subsystem that is plug and play to this system, and it can receive the information in real time and create the hologram in real time, intra-procedurally. The first place that we're going to is the interventional suite. The interventional suite is the place that you are, uh, the physicians are doing minimally invasive procedures 
So the patient is closed. Usually they are going, for example, for in the heart uh, cardiology. Uh, so they are going through the groin to the heart. So of course the patient is very closed. And when you look on the physician, the physician looks like this. He holds the catheters in his hand and his head is like this for one hour, two hour, three hour, sometimes five hours because he is relying 100% on imaging. He doesn't see anything because the patient is closed, the heart is closed, and he can see only data that comes from angiography, uh, from, from ultrasound, electrophysiology, and things like that. And this is why we focus our first application into this area, which is a very challenging area because it's, it has to be FDA approved, it is intra-procedural, but then from the other end, the need is huge. People that are working there are doing unbelievable things like fixing valves in the heart uh, and changing valves in the heart and it, the spatial understanding of whatever they are doing is extremely important and the understanding of what they are doing in real time is extremely important. And it's becoming, the interventional suite is becoming the hub of 3D in the hospital. Many 3D uh, technologies are, are going this way. This is a, a sneak peek into the system that will be launched uh, later this year. And we already have a, a first customer uh, here in North America. A little bit about the, the capabilities. So, of course, there is the wow effect, but we are way beyond the wow effect. Of course, we would like the physicians to have substantial added value when they use the, this uh, kind of a system. So, first of all, the first one is the visualization. If you see a hologram in front of you, so there is no question of what you see. We reduce the interpretation. So, for example, if you are looking on, uh, I don't know who of you saw ultrasound on 2D or things like that, it is very hard, very challenging to understand, and there is a lot of interpretation. Sometimes you interpret good, sometimes not. When you have this hovering in space heart in front of you, it's as clear as anything else in our life. So we understand it, uh, exactly what we see. Then you can do things uh, that you cannot do with other techniques because you literally can touch the image with a hand or a tool or a mouse, and you can move the image to any angulation that you like. You can cut the image with your finger. You can mark things inside with a tool or your hand. You can do anything you like with the image since the image is fully digital. So maybe some of you uh, saw this uh, Grey's Anatomy series. So, um, so of course these guys are taking and doing post-processing. Uh, I think they did a beautiful job for us. Uh, so they are, they are taking uh, and doing post-processing. The question is how far this is from reality. And I would like to say that we don't have so, such a good actors in, in real view imaging, but we have real hearts. This is a real patient heart. It's city-based, it's hovering in free space, it occupies a real volume, and it is uh, made of 20 focal planes. When you are, first of all, the visualization is very hard to let you understand or get a feeling on the visualization. Since I'm showing you hologram on a 2D screen, it's like showing color on black and white, but you can see that the physician can now go, this is, I think, one-to-one -one scale of the human heart, he can go and touch the specific elements that he doesn't want to see. It is pre-segmented. And then, this is the left atrium. He is able to touch the left atrium. Now he can cut it because he wants to ablate inside. This is a rehearsal. This is not real time. Meaning the images are real time, but the patient is not here. Now, everything is spatially registered in front of the physician. And he can uh, treat this uh, element, or ob object, left atrium in this, er uh, in this example, like any other object in life. And here, for example, he will try to make ablation points in a specific area. This is a very common procedure, unfortunately. I will show you a little clip uh, of some of the medical imaging that we have been working on for the, for the past years. So 
Fidel imaging is of course very interesting. This is one of the places that we're looking. So imagine the physician can receive the information just like ultrasound from, uh, from uh, the, the cardiology, from, from the heart. And then you can cut the image, of course not cut the fetus, but cut the image and see inside. This is a real person's aorta and a stent with a valve before implement implantation. This is a simulation mode. This is mapping of the left atrium for electrophysiology. So as, the, as the mapping goes, the left atrium structure is being built, and what you see on it are the, cur uh, are the electricity on the left atrium. This is information that we receive from a third party. We are creating the hologram, not the data. These are the pulmonary veins coming from uh, 3D rotation and geography. This is called pseudo real time. It's being done intra procedurally, but then you have after four seconds, you have only uh, uh, one volume. This is real time ultrasound. It's very hard to grasp it on a 2D screen, but this is real time. The patient is lying here and his heart is there. When the catheter is introduced to the same area, you, you see it very clearly. Here the physician is making a measurement of the hole. This is a patient with a hole in the heart, in the septum, before closure. Today, they are closing the, the hole in the heart, in the septum, a minimal invasive with a catheter. This one you saw, I think, with a better resolution. So, uh, first of all, I'm happy to say that we've made uh, first holographic uh, human clinical trials with the collaboration with Philips Healthcare for the Netherlands. So they, uh, they streamed the ultrasound in real time to us and the 3D and geography, and in real time we received it. So on this bed here, a patient was lying. In real time, his heart was captured dynamically, received in our system, and the heart was hovering in free space in real time. The physician was able to see the heart, the anatomy, move it around, cut it, make measurements, see the catheter inside, everything intra-procedurally. Our company is, uh, is known in the medical area, especially in uh, interventional cardiology, and we've been in stealth mode for many years now. We feel that our technology is becoming mature, and this is actually the first time that we present here at the AWE, although we're coming here uh, every once in a while. One additional system that we're working is, imagine that when the interventional cardiologist is working, so his hands are here where the groin is, and the heart is here, so the hologram is here. But when you're working, for example, on something that is direct, like taking a biopsy from the liver, or delivering energy to a, to a tumor. So you would like to work directly with the image. So what we're doing, we're taking the same system, we now lower it down, and the hologram now is within the body. So we, the, the patient goes into the city, goes out of the city, and now we can register the image on the liver, for example, and then the physician can see the, again, the patient is closed. The, the physician can see uh, the hologram inside. He can see the tumor, and then he can go with a needle directly and take, for example, a biopsy or deliver energy to the tumor. When we're going to the head-mounted display, so as I mentioned, it allows us to reduce the system dramatically because it's much closer to the eye and gives uh, performance only to a very specific user and not to 
Anybody? And the place that we are going are places that uh, a professional needs the information for a long period of time. He can sit for the entire day, work, for example, on CAD or on architecture or scientific visualization. Or, for example, if you are now working on a, an engine and you would like to go with a screwdriver to a specific location, so you'll be, after a short while, you'll be very irritated if the, your brain will be, or the perceptual uh, visual system will be irritated if the focus is not in the correct location. Especially if you try to go to a place even that you don't see, because you can light the hologram just like in the Holoscope X, and the hologram that is inside the body, so you can have the hologram, half of it uh, outside uh, the mechanical fixture, and maybe some of it is inside, and you can go with a screwdriver to the right location, because actually you see it as if it is transparent. And the places uh, and the added values are almost immediate. Um, first of all, it leverages the pre-existing volumes that you have on your whatever CAD or architecture or scientific visualization modality. You can actually see the image in front of you, like printing it uh, with light in 60 hertz. The spatial registration uh, of the hologram can be with a very specific element. For example, I can take this bottle, maybe it's empty, and I can superimpose a hologram and doing simulation, for example, of the flow or for finite elements or, f or to have something that is registered with the image and I can move it around and better understand the assembly that I'm doing before I actually go and manufacture it. Of course, the images are very precise, so you can work with them for a long period of time. And you can interact with them either with a tool, with a mouse, with your hand. And again, most important that you don't want the person that is working on the CAD or on the engine, you want him to work, uh, you don't want him to go at the end of the day with a headache. And with this system, of course, uh, there is no problem. We have a lot of experience with physicians working on these systems from, for many, many hours. I would like to show you a, a, a little uh, clip that we did uh, bef just before coming here. So it's a little rough. But what you see here is a little bit of the capabilities that will be um, available with the headset, the holographic headset. We call it Holoscope P. So here you see a 3D image on the computer, and you see part of the assembly in the hand here. Of course, I can focus on one of them. So if I focus on this, the assembly is now out of focus. So what we're doing, of course, the camera is looking through our system right now. So we can take away the image and pull it from the computer. You see now it's out of focus there, but the image is in focus here. I think this is the, this is the best hologram I ever saw, I think. So now you have the hologram in your hand. This is a 20 focal plane hologram. You can see that it's very realistic. Again, the camera is focused only on one plane. So the closer planes and the further planes are a bit out of focus, just like any object in life. We, we can track your hand, and we do that. And we can also give the user to move the hologram with a mouse, with a 3D mouse. We have uh, an ability to press on a button and bring the image to one-to-one -one scale. And then we can take a real object and put it inside. This is mixed reality. Now you can get a feeling, and we are now working to get them together. You can move one, and everything moves with it. You can cut the image just with your hand or with a pencil. We can track a pencil just like a hand. It's easier, by the way, with a pencil. But this is just to make a point here. Double meaning. Here I'm touching a specific location in the image. Once I touch it, I mark it. It becomes part of the geometry, and now I can move everything. It is, uh, trust me, it's much, the impression is much bigger when you do it with a hologram. Of course, we can do it not only with static elements, but also with dynamic elements. I'm sorry for this preface. So for example, you see here this uh, differential, fully dynamic, of course. And now, with the mouse, we bring it extremely close. I think it is, uh, I don't know, 
15 centimeters from the eye. So you can see the middle is in focus. The closer is a little bit out of focus, again, because the camera can be focused only on one area. And you can actually hold this uh, differential in your hand very intuitively. And of course, you can do anything you like with it. You can move it around, cut it, crop it, mark it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And very soon, you'll be able also to take uh, a piece of it, if you have the hardware in your hand, put it inside, and it will glue to it. And then you can move them both together. So uh, the, I would like to summarize. Um, I think the my, my most important for me is to, to tell you guys, you, evidently you are interested in holography, that holography is here. Uh, usually when you talk with uh, physics and optics uh, from universities, they tell you that holography is beautiful. This is the holy grail of 3D, but it's probably going to be in 20 years. And they said the same 10 years ago. So I would like to tell you that holography is here. It is working. It's going to be commercial this year. Um, and the other thing I would like to emphasize is that if you like to show an image that is depth retina display, that you can work for a long period of time, that is precise in space, you have to have a multitude of focal planes. So if you're working, let's say, between 20 centimeters to a meter, you, you need at least 20 focal planes. Uh, and if you want to work for the entire spectrum, so you need around 30 focal planes. Another thing that I would like uh, to emphasize is that interaction zone and display zone belong together when it, when it is in hand reach. So doing something here and something happens there, this is very good for some applications. But if you are trying to do something within the image, so it, is a real, uh, it gives a real value for the user to really see something in the same area that is working uh, in the image. So uh, Warren Buffett said this bombastic uh, statement, only when the tide goes out do you discover who has been swimming naked. So, so when, when it comes to real-time interaction with close images, with close images, so uh, the number of focal planes is extremely important, and we believe that uh, holography gives a substantial added value there. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Any questions? All right. What is being displayed in real time in the operating room? In the operating room, there is real-time ultrasound. There is also real-time navigation. And there are things that, for the physician, they are real-time. For us engineers, it's pseudo-real-time. For example, 3D and geography that creates a volume uh, in four seconds. So this is like real-time. Uh, but the interactions, of course, are in real-time. That's it? OK. Size of the panel for the headset, size of up, size of volume, fixed installation. Uh, these are kind of uh, more sensitive uh, information, so uh, I'll be happy to answer that in a more uh, uh, structured conversation with whoever is asking. But I can tell you that our uh, technology is configurable. We are doing a specific size of the image for the physicians because they want uh, the image to be a, at a specific distance and with a specific size. I can tell you that the headset uh, configuration is uh, dramatically bigger. I think it is comparable with the field of view is comparable to anything you see uh, below here in the expo. Thank you very much.